And welcome again to Carter's Talk. I am Russ Goldman, and joining me today to do the show is a good, I'm going to call him a friend of mine now, and his name is Ash, and he's from the upcoming podcast called FFC and Me. He just interviewed me, so I thought, you know what? Come on, Cottage Talk. We're going to talk about Fulham. We're going to learn a little bit about Ash and his new podcast. I certainly would recommend everyone listening to his podcast when it does go live. And on top of it, we're going to talk about, we have two really interesting topics to talk about. And as we look forward to the upcoming match for Fulham against Brentford, we're going to talk about how does Fulham overcome the loss of Zhao Polina. Interesting. And we're also going to be sharing our thoughts on the upcoming situation with Menor Solomon. So we have a lot to talk about in this quick, probably about a half hour show. Before we do anything else, I just always want to, Mention, please do subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. It does help Fulham supporters find us. Okay. Ash, thank you. As always, I really appreciate you coming on Cottage Talk, interviewing me. That was very nice of you to interview me. Thank you so much for joining me on Cottage Talk today. Uh, it's my pleasure, Russ, to say, uh, as we just spoke about, I've, I've listened to the uh, the podcast for a long time, so I'm very pleased to to come on and uh, put my two pence in about a few a few situations. So that's fine by me. Okay, well, we're going to do that. But before we do that, I want everyone to learn about this new podcast that you're doing. It's actually a great idea, Ash. You're going to be in- interviewing Fulham supporters. You've interviewed a few. And just tell everyone about the podcast and when it does go live, where they can access it. Yeah, so the, the podcast itself is slightly different to uh, – uh, well, I, I think it's slightly different to a normal sort of Fulham podcast. We have some absolutely brilliant podcasts it, uh, for most Fulham fans to listen to. Uh, but this show is going to be, uh, it's not about the sort of weekly ins and outs of the club. It's about Fulham fans. Um, I'm, I'm looking to speak to sort of fans from all over the world, the UK, as well as further, uh, further afield, especially those that sort of run uh, supporters groups, podcasts like yourself um, who go out of their way especially to sort of try and follow the club. Um, The main reason for it is because uh, as a London-based Fulham fan I love to know how people stay committed to supporting a club like ours. Um, I love to find out why people fall in love with a club like ours Um, and I also want to sort of learn about what makes us as a fan base tick, what makes us as a fan base feel like as we all like to say like a fulham family so that that that's one of the reasons why the other reason why is uh is a little bit more nerdy on my part um is that it's sort of uh, an anthropological look at us as a football club um so it's an awful it's an awful good way to sort of get to know other fans and i'm very hopeful that um i've had some sort of decent uh, responses to my outcries for people to get involved um, and I'm hoping to get some more people involved. So if anybody out there who sort of does want to take part, sort of wants to tell your story of sort of how you became a Fulham fan, as well as giving your opinions on sort of more quirky things like your favourite kits and and stuff like that, um, to sort of follow us on Twitter. Um, our handle is at FFC and me. And just send us a private message and say that you want to get involved. Um, say I'm I, I just lucky enough to just interview you, you just now. Um, it, it is quite fun. It's not meant to be anything serious. There's no right or wrong opinions in it. It's all just about getting to know you as a Fulham fan. Um, and then obviously anyone who, who watches it will also get to, to know you as a Fulham fan. Um, at the moment, the show is due to go live this Wednesday um, with my first show. Um, it will be on YouTube. Um, we are hoping that eventually it will become a podcast that will get released on sort of the normal podcast routines um, but at the moment it's just sticking with as a youtube channel um so if you go onto youtube and you search for ffc and me you'll see the channel there you'll see the premiere which is due for this wednesday again as many people that could like like and subscribe to that would be absolutely brilliant sort of share it with your, your full of mates as well because i want to grow that um and obviously the more interested it is the more interested people will get to interview um, and obviously there is a few sort of dream people that I'd love to interview. 
and we want to get to that point. So, yeah, if, if anyone who's on Twitter, follow us on Twitter. Anyone who uses YouTube regularly, please have a look for us there. Okay, excellent. Well, I'm actually going to put you in the hot seat now because you had me in the hot seat for a good 45 minutes. So I'm going to ask you this. You've now interviewed Sammy James, myself, and Jack. So you've done your first three episodes. What has stood out from your first three episodes? What have you learned? I think uh, one of the things I've learned so far is, especially when I sort of think about my own personal experiences of being a Fulham fan, you learn very quickly that um, everybody comes to the club in different ways. Um, and and not everyone is sort of birthright a Fulham fan, taken from when they're a kid, and then it just becomes a natural progression of how to become a Fulham fan, which would be how I became a Fulham fan, sort of taken from a baby and sort of didn't really have a choice. So it's, <laughs> it's, always, it's always interesting to sort of find out why uh, people sort of come to Fulham and then stay at Fulham. Um, and that's been some of the, the interesting things that I found out so far. Um, it's also been very good to find out how people like, like yourself and like Jack, who run podcasts about Fulham, who are not based in the UK, um, and how easy it is to do that and how it is, easy it is to stay sort of in contact and feel like you're part of uh, like the, uh, the Fulham family, as we say. Um, so that's been very interesting so far. Well, what's interesting to me, and uh, after you interviewed me, I was thinking about this, and I love that you already talked a little bit about this, Ash, before we talk about the foam stuff that we're going to talk about on this show. It really is a family, and I see it that way. It's been a family that has welcomed me, welcomed so many from around the world, and it can be local. It can also be global, and that's what's great about it. But what it really is, it's a family. And one of the things that actually, as a family, I don't think other supporters from other clubs don't get sometimes because I hear about, and uh, you probably have seen this, Ash, even recently I had this uh, supporter come at me a little bit about Fulham's supporters, and I will defend Fulham supporters. It's not about being the loudest. It's not about singing the best. It's not about all that. That's part of the experience. But it's truly, for me, what separates Fulham from these other supporters that support other clubs, it's truly as a family. I keep going back to that. We support each other, but we support Fulham Football Club. We're all in it together. And it's not just about being the loudest. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's very true. Um, I, one of the things I would say that I've sort of found in the time that I've been trying to put this whole thing together is uh, I've had an awful lot of support from the Fulham podcast community, um, yourself, Sammy James, who has been absolutely detrimental in me starting this thing up. He's, I can't even begin to thank him enough for the amount of input he's put in to help me. Um, and then Jack, the guys at uh, That's So Craven, um, I've been lucky enough. I've been on their podcast. I was on their podcast last Sunday. Um, I've sort of started to do a little bit of work with them on this side of the, on this side as well, just to help out. Um, it's been it's been great, um, and it's very true that about the Fulham family thing. That has sort of proved it to me quite a lot as well, um, because I am aware I've got friends who do podcasts for other football clubs, and there can be quite a lot of animosity between football club between podcasts within the same football club because people are sort of afraid that you're sort of stepping on people's toes. And I know what I'm doing is slightly different, so it shouldn't be the case. But um, I've definitely found that there's an awful lot of mutual support and respect from people within the, the the podcast community. And I'm hoping that it'll be the same, obviously, when we get to speak, when I get to speak to fans too. Right. And I think you'll see that. And because obviously many reach out to me and uh, you know, and again, just uh, we don't have many comments, but I'm just going to share this from Wayne Walden. We're one big family at the cottage. And that is really true. My friend, that really is true. And uh, that to me speaks volumes. And, Again, I'm not trying to slight any other supporter of any other club. Ash, this is my club. This is your club. I just think we're special. I think we're a little bit different. Yeah, and I, I get that. And I know that anyone who supports any other team will sit there and they'll say the same thing that, you know, that they they feel that they're a bit, they, they feel special too. But I think it is different. There's a different atmosphere going, that, that atmosphere going to Fulham. 
Um, everyone's welcome. You know, I've never really ever had any issues at Fulham um, from other Fulham fans. And there are many, many people that I barely speak to, but, you know, we'll know each other by face through going to Fulham and we'll see each other on a match day, sort of say hello, catch up sometimes. But, you know, that that's that's how family works anyway, isn't it? So you're not exactly. always necessarily the closest the closest with everyone that you're you're around, but you know you always like to know that everyone's doing well and that uh, uh, everyone sort of supports each other, and that's that that's what I found so far. Okay, excellent. All right, let's get into cottage talk now, talking about two situations that I want to get your thoughts on. One involves Paulina. You and I were messaging back and forth, and this is something I've talked a little bit already on Cottage Talk, how would Fulham be able to deal with the loss of Jao Polina? I think this is a very interesting two matches coming up. How are they going to be able to deal with two sides who want to have the ball, Ash? We're talking Brentford and we're talking Arsenal. How are they going to be able to deal with these midfields? I mean, they are two very good battles that they're going to be dealing with here with both clubs. So how are they going to be able to do it? So let's start here. Who do you think is going to play the Paulina role? Because you could say it's going to be Harrison Reed. Could it be Lukic? Could it be someone that we're not expecting? Who do you think is going to play the Paulina role? And But let's start here. How concerned are you? It's fine. I'm quite concerned because Paulina has proven so far this season that nobody else can sort of do what he does he's not you don't become the best tackler in the league off you off of no reason you don't become one of the most committed midfielders without putting the legwork in and it's been a long time since we've had someone in midfield who is capable to take charge like he is um, and is capable to demand the center of the field like he is so whoever does step in on monday night is going to have massive massive shoes to fill because they're going to have to not just play as well as they can. They're going to have to try and do some of the stuff that Jao does sort of naturally. And that's going to be very, very hard, no matter who sort of has to step in. Um, and when you sort of, you think about Brentford and the way they play, I think that you, it's interesting you should say for Brentford and for Arsenal, we might have to look at these two games slightly differently because okay. I think that they they both sort of have different, attributes that we have to be very very wary of um and i think that whoever has to come in to fit, fit jow's to fit in for jow is gonna have to probably have two of the best games of their their season to just to sort of make it look like he's not missing um so i, I am very very concerned that he's not going to be playing obviously okay and so am i and here's the thing that i did ash I went back and I watched the last match when Paulinho went off for just about 10 plus minutes to get an idea of what I think is going to happen. I don't know if this is exactly what's going to happen, but I have a feeling it's going to be Harrison Reed playing Paulinho's role and Lukic playing the Reed role. So it's a very small sample. We're talking 10 minutes. And I saw some things in these 10 minutes. I said, okay, I could see how this could work. But I could also see that it, it could be very different from what we're accustomed to. But your thoughts on, let's just play the game and say Harrison Reed plays the role. Here is my issue with this. Now, say Harrison Reed plays the role. He is now have, has this defined role as someone that is basically a box-to-box midfielder that is basically just pestering the other team. So now you're kind of taking that away. You're taking that away to play the Paulinho role. Do you think that Harrison Reed will be the player to play the Paulinho role? And do you think if, if he does, that that might hurt Fulham in another way in his old position? Yes. Yeah. I think that I, I, I agree with you. I think that Reed is going to sort of step up into Paulinho's role and then Lukic is going to have to play the, the Reed role. Um, but I think that the part, the biggest problem is, especially against Brentford on, on Monday, is that we're going to have to be very, very solid in the middle of the park. They're going to be attacking very high and they're going to 
So whoever is playing in that position is going to not only have to support whoever else is playing the the sort of defensive role, is going to have to be an, an outlet for Pereira as well. Right. And uh, whether or not Reed can do that, I I it's not that I don't think he can because I I Harrison Reed has been nothing but but great this season in playing his role, but he hasn't had to play that link up role as much because Paulinho has been doing it so well. That's right. Um, Lukic Lukic sort of. He just uh, in the in the brief games I've seen him play uh, at Fulham and sort of in Italy, he he does play box to box quite well. He can play box to box, um, so he may they they may well sort of use both of them sort of interchanging as the game goes along, sort of just trying to trying to break up what could be a sort of quite a stubborn Brentford like midfield. Um, so I, I the honest answer is I it's hard to say exactly how those two will will play there like that. Um, but I think that they have a good chance to sort of be quite interchangeable during the game. And I think it would be one that we might see that one of them will play a bit more advanced than the other. And I wouldn't be too shocked if after 10, 15 minutes, they change over and they sort of keep doing that throughout the game to sort Very of keep the midfield fresh. And that's actually, a, a, I wouldn't be against that type of strategy, Ash, because I think that they also need to figure out how this is all going to play out. They're going to be doing this for two matches now. Like you said, they're different teams that they're playing against, different midfields. So they're going to have to figure this out, and they might have to do it, I hate to say it, on the fly. They're going to have to see what works and what doesn't work and how that they can, like you said, and also keep fresh because they're probably going to be working extremely hard. The one thing that I that I will say is that in the short period of time where I've seen Lukic, he obviously offers something different than Reed does in that position. Would you say that he is closer to – I wouldn't call him doing like that Kearney role, but he's closer to that than doing the Reed role. Um, in in the couple of games I've seen him play for us, especially, he does seem to play the Kearney role a little bit more. He's been sort of quite comfortable being on the ball and pushing up. He's been quite comfortable being that person who sort of plays slightly more advanced. And he is very good at sort of controlling the ball and being on the ball. Um so it wouldn't I wouldn't be too surprised if he starts in that position and then sort of Reed stays where he's naturally been. But I think that both of them are gonna to have to sort of be interchangeable as the game goes along. And I also think that there's a high higher possibility that maybe Bobby Decodover Reed might have to sort of play a bit more of a central role in this game as well if he plays. Um and I think that that, that may well sort of be a team of three that sort of have to cover what pa- Paulinia does in the sense of making sure that that we're sort of covering all the bases on defence and in attack. Because I, I see Monday's game being quite fluid and being quite being quite sort of gung-ho and being back and forth. Whereas I don't see the Arsenal game being that way. I, sort of the, I see the Arsenal game being a bit more us defending and have to counter. counter. Right. I, don't, I don't think the Brentford game will be like that. I think the Brentford game is going to be a little bit more end-to-end. And so there's going to be an awful lot of box-to-box midfield needed naturally in order to get through the game. So, as I say, I think that there might be a little bit of interchange between them. Um, but I think Sasha will probably start in sort of Paulinho's role. Okay. Because that's where he, when he has played, he's played a bit more further up front. Like, as you say, like a Tom Kearney would. Right. Um, so, I, 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 that's what I think will happen on Monday. Okay. And it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. I, I'm fascinated by it. I'm nervous by it. I do like what you said about Bobby Decker do read. It's funny because... You and I were just talking about on your show, cult heroes. I think Bobby Decker Dover Reed someday might be one because of all the roles that he plays. Ash, what's interesting about him is that he's very valuable. I always gravitate to players that can do so many different things, maybe not be excellent at any one thing, but can always help you when you need help. And that's Bobby Decker Dover Reed. So maybe he might be very valuable in this match against Brentford. Uh, we have to be honest. He's only not played in goal, isn't he? Like he's played everywhere else. <laughs> so I think I, I had this conversation with someone the other day on Twitter about they were saying that Bobby Deco Dover Reed's like probably not one of the best players in the league. But I was trying to explain to him that he's probably not the best player in any of the positions he plays in. But name me another player that can play in seven positions as comfortably as he can. Um, he he's a great utility player to have. 
Um, and I see on Monday he may well be very, very much needed. He, I don't think he'll start. I, I'll be very, very surprised to see him start. But I wouldn't be surprised, especially if we get put under the cosh quite soon, that he will end up on at some point to sort of help sort of stem that centre of the park. Because I don't think anybody else who's on the bench uh, no. will necessarily have the experience to be able to do that. Right. I'm going to share this comment from my friend Steve Reynolds. This is what he has to share, Ash. Reed will fill in as he's done all season. Need a bulldog to mix it up. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I fully agree with Steve. Like the you, we don't want to disrupt our own style that much anyway, because you don't want to go into a game as big as this Brentford game and then sort of messing around with the middle of the park because it's the most important part of the pitch for us, especially going forward. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about earlier when we were talking about this is actually if Mitrovic is fit to start, yes. because that way may well that may well also have an impact on who plays in midfield, because we're going to want some players that can link up quite easily, especially if, as I sort of feel like the game's going to be, if it's going to be as back to front as it is, we're going to need to be able to be quite fluid in getting the ball from back to front. So that that that's what I personally think that it may well be need. That's where Bobby may well have to come on, and Pereira's going to have to be on it as well. He's going to have to have probably not the games he's had the last couple of games he's played where he's he's not been in the mix um, he's probably going to have to get really stuck in in this game and that is one of the 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 biggest problems of losing a player like Paulinho is it, no matter what size of a club you are losing a player like that is you you need multiple players to cover the shift that he puts in that's right you need multiple players that's that's a good point ash what's interesting and I'm glad that you brought this up because if Mitro starts, which I ex expect him to, and comes back and is integral in the build-up play and they get the ball to him, I think that might relieve some of the pressure that we might be under. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I think that one of the things you, when you watch the game that Mitro is not played in is that Vinicius doesn't sort of he can't do give it. that link-up play very well. Yeah. Um, and that's not a slight on Vinny. He's not. He's just not Mitro, and no one's Mitro. Um, so it's we have to we have to be aware that everyone's going to have to be on it on Monday. Monday's going to be a very very intense game, um, and I think that the way that Brentford play is quite intense, and we're going to have to be on it. And I, that's what I say. I think that the the game's going to be very back and forth, and we're going to just have to make sure that whoever's in the middle of the park is controlled in the middle of the park, um, and it's going to be on probably Marco Silva to be watching and making sure that Lukic and Reed are able to switch over if needed, but because we don't want to have to make early subs or, you know, get completely destroyed in, in the center of the park. Right. And what's interesting. And uh, if you've listened or seen the comments from Marco in his presser or his interview on FFC TV, sounds like to me, Ash reading between the lines that, he is fully confident that he can have a player that can do the job. Not to do exactly what Paulinho can do, but it's almost, you know, and I'm used to this here with the teams I follow. It's next man up. You have to pick up the slack. And he is co he, confident that they can do it. Not only that, he's not planning on changing how Fulham play. Fulham, he, as he, he has already said, I'm paraphrasing, Fulham is still going to do what Fulham do, Ash. Well, let's be honest, we are we're, we're where we are in the table for a reason. It's because we play football the way we play football. Right. You know, barring a few barring a few away games where we've had to change up our style of play. And namely, that was because there was no Metro, not because there was no one in the centre of the park. Um, I don't see us changing the way we plan on playing this game. Um, and one of the things that is funny you should say about next one up, if we want to move up levels, if we want to be that team that are pushing for Europe, who are able to play in Europe, we're going to have to have players that can step up when players are not playing. So exactly. it's a great test. It's a great test for the squad on Monday. Um, but I have full I have full confidence that Sasha Lucic can cover that spot. Um, but, you know, it, it, I don't expect anything less of Marco Silva to be completely confident in the team because we've given him no reason to be... The players have given him no reason not to be confident. Um, and... I, I fully suspect whoever is going to play in that position on Monday, they're just going to be as wholehearted as as Jao Polina is anyway, because 
we're going to have to be intense and uh and i don't see i don't see that being a problem for harrison reed nope. and i don't think it'll be a problem for sasa lucic because i know we can tackle um you don't you don't play as many games as he did in italy <laughs> you don't play for the serbian national team if That's you're right. afraid to tackle so I, I i i i back him to sort of cover that position and as i say if he can't for whatever reason or you know someone gets to get a card i imagine that bobby deckard over could come in and he cover in, a yep. bit maybe not maybe not at their standards but could cover it and i'm glad that you brought this up ash what's great about this it's not ideal to have pauline out obviously we don't want pauline out but it also opens up an opportunity to see how far Fulham have come can they overcome this and I think that's important. They could not overcome it when they played Newcastle United when he was out. They couldn't. They went with Chalba. Obviously, there are circumstances that go along with that. But here's another opportunity. Let's see the growth. This would be a huge test, two huge tests coming up. And it might actually, if they can pass the test, Ash, propel them farther than we could imagine. That's how big this is. Yeah, yeah, I think that Lukic has to look at it as this is potential. He's he's sort of his test to see how well he's going to cope next year when he's probably going to have to play a bit more prominently than he is now. Right for Harrison Reed, I imagine he's he's this is the test of proving that you know he is as good as we all think he really is. Um, and Harrison Reed this season alone has stepped up massively. Um, he he stepped up massively because he probably wasn't seen as being able to cope in the league as well as he as well as he has done. But without Jao next to him, uh, without a little bit of oomph next to him, we have sometimes struggled. And that Newcastle home game, okay, let's forget the fact that Chalaba was sent off so early and it sort of left us so light in midfield that they didn't have a chance. There's been other games where he's had to step up and he has done so far. Um, and I, I said I'm quite confident going into Monday that we have enough, yep. but it's still going to be a massive test because I'm also very, very much aware of how good Brentford are in midfield, um, yep. and we we just have to be wary of that. Um, but I'm quite confident that they'll they'll be okay. I'm actually feeling I wouldn't say very confident, but I'm feeling confident that they will be prepared and they'll be ready to go, and that they'll have some answers. The question is, how many answers will they have? And who will step up? And this is a wonderful opportunity for players to step up. So I'm glad that we're talking about that. Great stuff, Ash. All right. Coming up next to end the show, Ash and I are going to talk about the situation with Menor Solomon. Okay, Ash, to end the show, I know you've seen the speculation. I've seen it as well. And we're going to continue to see this. The situation with Menor Solomon. He is on loan. And um, I've heard different things. I think we've all heard different things. and um, But it looks like it's just simply alone. So what's going to happen after the season? Will Fulham sign him permanently? Because there's no question that there are going to be big clubs coming in for him. So let's just get to it, my friend. How concerned are you with Fulham signing Menor Solomon permanently? I am extremely concerned about Fulham signing Manor Solomon uh, permanently. He's I know we've we've only seen him play less than 90 minutes of football in the Premier League, but he looks like he's an absolute level above some of the other things we have going on at the club. Um and again, it's going back to if we want to move up a level, we want to go up to the next the next stage of the football club, we need players like Manor Absolutely. Solomon. Absolutely. Um unfortunately. None of us really know the reasons why we didn't sign him for seven million euro or seven million pound when that deal was on the table with Shakhtar earlier on in the season. I've heard loads of conflicting stories about, you know, they originally the deal was agreed and then it was sort of because of the because of the, the outbreak of the war, it was sort of it was unagreed. I've also heard that, you know, Fulham were trying to be trying to do, be a bit sly and get it for free and we're hoping that we could sort of mess around that way. But I don't think that's the case. I think there's an awful lot of stuff behind the scenes that we're completely unaware of. I think there was a lot of grey in the way that deals were going on, especially with players coming out of Ukraine because of because of this new, you know, the UEFA rule about players being able to sign away from the country 
but not not sort of stopping their contracts, but sort of pausing them. Um, it is also slightly weird that Manor's contract was all the way going up to December. Very rarely players' contracts go to December. They tend to always go to sort of July. So that that was also a bit odd. Um, and I think that the, the, the biggest problem is, is that we can't really act on it. I know there's a lot of people that sort of want us to be working on a contract with Shakhtar now. There's a... That's all we can do. All we can do now is contact, talk to Shakhtar. We can't have any contact directly with Mana about signing until uh, the end of the season because if we do have too many con uh, talks about contracts now, we we're potentially breaking rules with the Bosna, uh, the Bosman rules. So we have to be very, very careful about trying to to talk our way around signing him. I think so the only way we can deal now is sort of talk with Shakhtar and hope that we can come up with some deal before somebody else gets in and tries to sign him. The only thing we can do as a football club is make sure that Manor feels as wanted and as loved as he already has been made to feel by lots and lots of Fulham fans and hope that he sort of falls in love with the club enough that he, he wants to stay and no matter what, you know, that's his next step. But I think an awful lot will depend on where we finish this season and how seriously we take trying to get him in um so we have to we have to see it's going to be very interesting to see how it all plays out but i agree with you ash i think one big part of this is going to be how Fulham finish the season because i think a player of his ability is going to want to play in europe so i think we're going to have to get into europe to convince him to sign with Fulham. And uh, so I think that also puts a lot of pressure on the club, but I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing, but I agree with you. The thing about it that irritates me is that there's so much talk. We don't know exactly how this all broke down, but I'm just hoping that they can get a deal done because this is the type of player you need. This is the type of player you need, as you said, to take you to the next level. He's already with you. But it sounds like you're going to have to convince him to stay. I think Fulham can show him the money. I, I, I don't think showing him the money is going to be the biggest problem. I think it's going to be the convincing to stay and say, hey, listen, we got a project here. Be a huge part of this. And that's what they're going to have yeah. to sell him on. Because when you've got clubs like Arsenal and Tottenham that are probably going to be after him, you're going to have to sell him on, on other things. that you're going to have an opportunity to play each and every week. You're going to be a focal point along with Metro each and every week. We're going to be depending on you each and every week. We're going to make you a big part of what we do. Maybe that will do it. But I think European football is probably going to have to be a part of it, Ash. Yeah, well, I think we're quite fortunate that this summer, one thing that we all need to remember, this summer we have an awful lot of FFP that's written off. Yeah. So we will have money to spend this summer. So I don't think financially the deal is going to be that much of an issue. The problem is, is going to be trying to get him to actually come in. One of the biggest things that we've had is, is as I said, and as you just agreed with it, we don't know, no one really knows the nitty gritty of this deal and how it no. was set up because they'll, it, it there we don't know a lot of people are sort of blaming the club for not getting a buy on clause not sort of putting in agreements but i don't think under the rules of the of the way that uefa put this deal deals about that we could do any of that i think that all we could do was sign him the way we signed him right. and hope that we can then get him on a permanent i think that we're going to have to sell him the project and that he's going to have to be given some guarantees that he's going to be sort of pushed in certain ways um, I think that players like Manor Solomon are very marketable as a club. So I think the club need to use that. I think the club are going to have to sell him in the sense that, you know, we're going to push you as an entity, not just as a player. Um, and we're going to have to hope that that's enough to keep him. Yeah. Um, but I do honestly think if anyone is going to come in and have to sort of take pull the rug under our feet, they're probably going to have to come in with a lot of money um, to do that which is the only scary thing for me is that I say we have money to spend during the summer. Right. It's whether or not, you know, we don't have someone who has ridiculous financial clout come in and go, well, that's true. Here's a water money and we can't, and we can't keep up with that. Well, that's crazy money. And, and foam, I think will show him the money, but like you said, is someone going to blow him away? And that's a possibility yeah. because if you see the ability that we've seen in such a short period of time, they're thinking 
that this could be the type of player that, you know, I saw today a, a gentleman in Israel thinks that he's a, a hundred million pound player. I, I don't know. I don't know if he's on that level, but he certainly is a very valuable player. And I think will be for years to come. I think he's only scratched the surface, Ash. You know, I've saw the comparisons to not just um, Eden Hazard, but also Robin too, you know, yeah. being that type of player. And you're talking, you're talking players on an extremely high level. That's what I think we have here. So it's going to be something we're going to have to fall. I, don't know how much can be done right now, but they should be doing whatever they can to convince him. And like you said, make sure he knows that we're going to do whatever we can with this project, and he would be a vital part of the project. That's the way I'm looking at it. All right, Ash, I've kept you longer than I said. Let's wrap this up. Any final thoughts before we go? Um. <laughs> About mana, about everything, really. I think no. When about we look everything. at when we look at when, when we look at when we look at the game on Monday, yep. um, I think we have to look at it slightly differently to how we look at the Arsenal game. As I say, they're going to be completely different games. Um, I think that all we can do is sort of get behind whoever is playing and then sort of push to hope that they can step up to it. With mana, I think we all just have to be on a bit of a wing on a prayer, light a few candles, and everyone yep. pray that he sort of stays. <laughs> but we'll we'll we'll, we'll see. Okay. Great stuff. Fantastic stuff. All right, Ash, before we go, one last time, please tell everyone about your show, which is going to be debuting on YouTube on Wednesday. Yeah, so as I said uh, earlier on in the pod, that um, FFC and me starts on YouTube. 8 a.m. is the premiere of the first episode, which was uh, was recorded with Sammy James um, from the Fulhamish podcast. We just look into... Uh, what it's like to be a Fulham fan, how people became Fulham fans, uh, why they stay Fulham fans, and we look at and we look. We're hoping to, as I say, speak to as many people around the world. So anyone who who is listening to this, who is a Fulham fan, maybe not from the UK, but I also want UK based fans to get involved. So follow us on Twitter, uh, FFC and me. Send me a DM. Um, because I want to try and sort of get as many people interviewed as possible because the hope for this is we'll have a new episode out every week. Oh, that's um, great. So I need more and more people to fulfill that, to fulfill that, to keep going forward. So thanks very much for your time, Russ. And uh, thank you very much for coming on the show to, to be interviewed as well. You are welcome. And uh, if you're interested, please do contact Ash at FFC and me on Twitter, get involved because I, it was such a joy doing it with you. I, I enjoy talking about my experience and I have a feeling everyone that does it with you will feel the same way. So please do get in touch with Ash. All right. Great stuff. Well, it is time to wrap up this show of Cottage Talk for my very special guest, Ash from FFC and me. I'm Russ Coleman. Thank you as always for watching and listening to Cottage Talk, now part of the Talk Sport Fan Network.